Prophets and Kings by Ellen G. White Chapter 48 Not by Might Nor by Power Immediately after Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel, the prophet received a message regarding the work of Zerubbabel. The angel that talked with me, Zechariah declares, came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my lord? Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Then answered I, and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick, and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again, and said unto him, What by these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes, empty the golden oil out of themselves? Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Zechariah 4, verses 1 to 6, and verses 11 to 14. In this vision, the two olive trees which stand before God are represented as emptying the golden oil out of themselves through golden tubes into the bowl of the candlestick. From this the lamps of the sanctuary are fed, that they may give a bright, continuous light. So from the anointed ones that stand in God's presence, the fullness of divine light and love and power is imparted to his people that they may impart to others light and joy and refreshing. Those who are thus enriched are to enrich others with the treasure of God's love. In rebuilding the house of the Lord, Zerubbabel had labored in the face of manifold difficulties. From the beginning, adversaries had weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building and made them to cease by force and power. Ezra 4, verses 4 and 23. But the Lord had interposed in behalf of the builders, and now he spoke through his prophet to Zerubbabel, saying, Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Zechariah 4, verse 7. Throughout the history of God's people, great mountains of difficulty, apparently insurmountable, have loomed up before those who were trying to carry out the purposes of heaven. Such obstacles are permitted by the Lord as a test of faith. When we are hedged about on every side, this is the time, above all others, to trust in God and in the power of His Spirit. The exercise of a living faith means an increase of spiritual strength and the development of an unfaltering trust. It is thus that the soul becomes a conquering power. Before the demand of faith, the obstacles placed by Satan across the pathway of the Christian will disappear for the powers of heaven will come to his aid. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Matthew 17, verse 20. The way of the world is to begin with pomp and boasting. God's way is to make the day of small things the beginning of the glorious triumph of truth and righteousness. Sometimes he trains his workers by bringing to them disappointment and apparent failure. 
It is his purpose that they shall learn to master difficulties. Often men are tempted to falter before the perplexities and obstacles that confront them. But if they will hold the beginning of their confidence steadfast unto the end, God will make the way clear. Success will come to them as they struggle against difficulties. Before the intrepid spirit and unwavering faith of a Zerubbabel, great mountains of difficulty will become a plain, and he whose hands have laid the foundation, even his hands shall also finish it. He shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Zechariah 4, verses 9 and 7. Human power and human might did not establish the church of God, and neither can they destroy it. Not on the rock of human strength, but on Christ Jesus, the rock of ages, was the church founded, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 16, verse 18. The presence of God gives stability to his cause. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, is the word that comes to us. Psalm 146, verse 3. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Isaiah 30, verse 15. God's glorious work, founded on the eternal principles of right, will never come to naught. It will go on from strength to strength, not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 4, verse 6. The promise, the hands of Zerubbabel, have laid the foundation of this house, his hands shall also finish it, was literally fulfilled. Verse 9. The elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. And they builded and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And this house was finished on the third day of the month Adar, the twelfth month, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. Ezra 6, verses 14 and 15. Shortly afterward, the restored temple was dedicated. The children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity, kept the dedication of this house of God with joy, and upon the fourteenth day of the first month they kept the Passover. Verses 16, 17, and 19. The second temple did not equal the first in magnificence, nor was it hallowed by those visible tokens of the divine presence which pertain to the first temple. There was no manifestation of supernatural power to mark its dedication. No cloud of glory was seen to fill the newly erected sanctuary. No fire from heaven descended to consume the sacrifice upon its altar. The Shekinah no longer abode between the cherubim in the most holy place. The ark, the mercy seat, and the tables of testimony were not found there. No sign from heaven made known to the inquiring priest the will of Jehovah. And yet, this was the building concerning which the Lord had declared by the prophet Haggai, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Haggai 2, verses 9 and 7. For centuries, learned men have endeavored to show wherein the promise of God, given to Haggai, has been fulfilled. Yet in the advent of Jesus of Nazareth, the desire of all nations, who by his personal presence hallowed the precincts of the temple, many have steadfastly refused 
to see any special significance. Pride and unbelief have blinded their minds to the true meaning of the prophet's words. The second temple was honored not with the cloud of Jehovah's glory, but with the presence of the one in whom dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, God himself manifest in the flesh. Colossians 2 verse 9, 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. In being honored with the personal presence of Christ during his earthly ministry, and in this alone did the second temple exceed the first in glory. The desire of all nations had indeed come to his temple when the man of Nazareth taught and healed in the sacred courts.